1 Kings chapter 19, we'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel, Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Let me just kind of interject this. If he wanted to die, why didn't he hang out and wait for Jezebel's servants? So he really didn't want to die. He just got a good case of the pooch mouth. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. I'm thankful joy cometh in the morning. And God, I'm thankful for the promises that you give us in the scriptures like that. God, I'm thankful that even though we may have to weep through the night, we're not alone while we're weeping. And God, I'm thankful for the hope and the peace that only you can bestow. God, we're certainly blessed tonight. God, we're blessed beyond our deserving. And we thank you for that. Now, Father, help us through the next few minutes enlighten our minds and touch our hearts to ever desire the things of God like we never had before. Bless those that are working with the teens on the other side. Lord, you know the peer pressure the teens are facing. And so, Father, I pray that the word of God be large deep in their, lodged deep in their heart that they might not sin against thee. Now, Father, help us this night to be reminded of the greatness of Christ. Be with those that are sick. Touch them. Touch Brother Jesse and Miss Tammy and uh, Miss Debbie. And God, we pray for them. I pray for uh, Miss Mary's uh, uh, relative there in the hospital in the cardiac unit. God, I'm glad you've already touched and moved. I pray you'd continue to touch her. And then, Father, I pray for this 22-year-old in the car wreck. Lord, you'd be with her and help her. God, be with those that are providentially hindered. Miss Judy that's traveling. Be with her and others, Lord, that desire to be here tonight. Miss Renee and others, God, I pray you'd bless them and help them. And God, those that are here tonight, I pray you'd do something extremely uh, wonderful for them. Bless them abundantly. Give them something extra. And Father, we'll thank you for it. For it's in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. We think of Elijah, or at least when I think of him, I think of a giant in the scriptures. Show me another man that prayed down fire from heaven. Show me another man that jumped on a chariot of fire and went to heaven. Hmm? I mean, we think of a giant. Uh, when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah shows up. I mean, he is uh, uh, certainly one of the heralded prophets, not only uh, in Israel, but in the Scriptures. When we think of that, and I don't know about you, but when I think about somebody that uh, 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 prominent, you probably think, boy, they, they had it made. They never had any problems. Well, I got to thinking about all the traumas that Elijah faced. First of all, he faced the traumas of the water drying up by the brook down at Cherith. Well, we like talking about Cherith over there in uh, uh, chapter 17. We like talking about that. We like talking about Elijah uh, just minding God and praying that it won't rain. And, and the Lord sends him down the brook Cherith, and he sits there, and every morning, every evening, here comes uh, uh, ravens with meat and flesh. Uh, and he's uh, just feasting by the brook, and he's uh, enjoying life, enjoying the goodness of God until the water's dried up. See, friend, you can live without food, but you can't live without water. And so there's a trauma in his life. And he begins to ask God, okay, God, what next? Then the Lord sends him to Zarephath. And you know the story there where the widow was going to make a cake and, and her and her son were going to eat it and die. And what a man of God. He goes in and says, make me one first. I know a lot of me first preachers. But anyway, uh, she made him one first and then had one for uh, her and her son. And then from then on, every time she needed meal, she went to the barrel, scraped out what she had, 
went and got and squeezed the crews of oil in the oil cape, and uh, until God moved, she had oil and meal for them to be sustained. Amen. Boy, we think, hallelujah, what a blessing. Boy, it must have been good to be Elijah. But if you read on there in chapter 17, down about uh, uh, verse 17, the widow's son died, and she begins to blame Elijah. She said, I was ready for us to die. And you showed up and gave us hope. And she begins to indict him. And can you imagine the trauma? Uh, all he's doing is trying to mind God, and all of a sudden, where he went to be a blessing, now it's a detriment. Of course, we know God raises the boy back alive. But he didn't know God was going to raise that boy alive. So we've got the trauma of the waters drying up, the trauma of the widow's son dying there in Zarephath. I thought about the trauma of the warfare on Mount Carmel. He comes into town in chapter 18. They start accusing him. You're the one that's troubling Israel. No, it was the sin of the wicked king and his household that was troubling Israel. Um, but they're blaming the man of God. You wouldn't believe how many times I get blamed for people's problems. Mm -hmm. They began to blame him. They began to indict him. And he said, tell you what, let's have a little contest. Uh, all the prophets of Baal, you offer up sacrifice, and I'll offer up sacrifice. Whoever's uh, God can deliver fire from heaven, that's the God Israel will serve. They like that idea. And you know the story. Uh, all day, the, the prophets of Baal, they built an altar, they offered up sacrifice, uh, they prayed and they prayed, and then they sang and they chanted, and they jumped up and down on the sacrifice, and they cut themselves. They went through a whole big uh, 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 fallacy of worship. Nothing happened. I believe it's 63 words as uh, Elijah prays. And after 63 words, fire fell. Can you imagine the trauma of everybody mocking him the whole time he's standing there? The trauma of having to witness all that false worship? Now, I don't know about you, but you know, if I channel surf and I see you know, something that isn't true, some of the things on TV that's called religious, it does something all the way down to my spinal cord because I realize they're deceiving people. And he's sitting there having to endure that. Then he had to resurrect the altar that they tore down. Then he had to offer up sacrifice. You know the story. He had them come and bring water and pour water on it. And so much that it filled up a trench all around it. Now if there's such a shortage of water, where did they get the water from? Because I tell you who didn't do it without water? The king. Then he prayed and fire fell. Then we've got the trauma of Elijah where wicked Jezebel begins to accuse him. She said, I'm going to have him killed. Hmm? Listen, the strongest saint of God can be worn down. You've only got so much fight in you, friend. You can put on the whole armor of God all you want to, but enough people stab you in the back, you'll get weary and well-doing. He's, he's faced trauma after trauma after trauma. By the way, three and a half years of trauma he's faced now. And finally, wicked Jezebel, she's the final straw that breaks the camel's back. He leaves for Beersheba of Judah. Leaves his servant there, goes another full day's journey. And then he's faced with the waves of insecurity. He sits down underneath the juniper tree in verse number 4, and this is what he says. He requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than any of my fathers. You see, there was a point where he had confidence in the Lord. There was a point where he had confidence in his own abilities. You don't just show up and challenge the whole nations without having the confidence that God's going to send fire. You don't have a, 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 a you know, you're, you're not lacking confidence if uh, 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 you go and sit by a brook and expect God to send ravens with food and bread every day. You know, there's a point through all of this, he's trusted God, he has confidence in God, and in his confidence of God, he himself gets to the point where he realizes, you know what, we can handle this thing. 
until the final wave hits him and Jezebel, and then all of a sudden insecurities flood in. Hmm? Listen, I know a little bit about this. There's been times when I was ready to charge hell with a water pistol. And then there's times you feel like you're carrying hell with you everywhere you go. You feel like the devil's sitting right on your shoulder. There's times when you preach to folks and you preach to folks and you preach to folks and you think they're finally going to get it. Before long, they're the very ones accusing you. And all of a sudden, you begin to doubt if everything you've done has been for naught. He's got to a place where he's insecure now. He says, God, I'm not any better than my fathers. In other words, he's saying, all the prophets came for me. I'm not any better than them. A lot of them have been stoned and killed. He said, Lord, I thought we was accomplishing something, but really I'm not anything. He said, just take my life. He said, it is enough now. And that final wave of insecurity floods his soul. You ever been there? You ever been there where you felt like God wasn't hearing any of your prayers anymore? You remember when you was on the mountaintop and nothing seemed to bother you, affect you? But now you seem like you're in a valley. You seem like used to everything you touch turned to gold and everything you touch falls apart. It seems like wave after wave after wave after wave, something keeps coming and you feel like you've had it. You know, might be sickness, might be something going on on the job, might be something in your family, your personal life, might be something in your financial life. Just things just keep hitting you. Wave after wave after wave. Now listen. Miss Nett loves going to the beach. You watch them waves come in and go out. And come in and go out. Now number one, that's good sleeping weather. That can put you to sleep right now. That's soothing. But you watch them. Every time them waves go out, they take a little bit more of the sand with them. Every time you get hit, a little more gets taken away. Every time you get hit, a little bit more is affected. And waves keep hitting you, keep hitting you. What's his response? It is enough now. I want to give you something out of this text along this thought. Miss Mary said it in her testimony. God is big enough to overcome our it is enoughs. Let me give you that again. God is big enough to overcome our it is enoughs. There are times you are going to weep through the night, you're going to say it is enough. But I've got good news, God is big enough to overcome your it is enough. There's times when you feel tempted to just quit, feel tempted to find yourself a juniper tree, feel tempted to throw in the towel, feel tempted to say that's enough, I can't handle anymore, that's all I'm going to face. But I've got good news, God's big enough to hand you your it is enough. Hmm? Let me show you how God handled Elijah's it is enough. By the way, after this chapter, you never see Elijah ever doubt or become insecure again. Hmm? Matter of fact, from this chapter, he's headed to a chariot of fire. Hmm? How come he realized again that God is big enough? You know God's big enough, but when you're underneath your juniper tree, you can't see God. All you can see is the juniper tree. Hmm? So how does God help this man of God who's requesting God kill him? That it's enough. Well, let's look at it, okay? First of all, can I say this? God shook him. Look at verse number 5. And as he laid and slept under the juniper tree, boy, them juniper trees are hard to get away from. Hmm? As he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold then... An angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Anytime you find the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's the Lord Jesus himself manifesting himself in the Old Testament. So the Lord shows up and touches him. Hmm? The Lord shook him. Can I help you with something? When you think it is enough, God will show up and he'll touch you. He shook him. He awoke him from his sleep he shook him he got a hold of sometimes God has to shake us when we're under our juniper tree sometimes he has to stir our remembrance of whose we are 
Sometimes he has to stir us to remind us of what he's already done for us. Uh, sometimes he has to shake us because uh, while we're under our juniper tree, we're not trusting in him, uh, and he's got to send something our way to shake us up uh, so we'll remember uh, 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 the vows and the things that God's made to us and the things that we've made to God. Uh, Sometimes God just has to shake us, friend. Uh, 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 sometimes He shakes us with uh, uh, some of the very troubles that you're wanting God to deliver you from. Uh, he might have sent that into your life to shake you uh, so He can get you out of, from underneath your juniper tree uh, and get you to where He can get you on a chariot of fire and use you in a blaze of glory. Uh, friend, He shook him. Sometimes God has to shake us because every time that wave hits you, you're doubting God a little bit more. So God sometimes has to shake us. He's got to touch us. There's nothing like a touch from God. Hmm? And by the way, when God touches you, you know it's God. Hmm? Uh, God shook him. But can I say this secondly? Then God just supplied what he had need of. Look with me in verse number 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Hmm? Uh, say, where, where did the cake and where did the cruise of water come from? Uh, duh, it's God. God don't need an oven to bake a cake. He's God. You say, well, I just don't believe God can do that. Well, go over there in John chapter 20 and find where he's fixing fish and bread on the seashore and, and, and answer we, where he got the fish and the bread. He's God. Hmm? He could have had the fish drop out of a tree. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. Uh, the important thing is Elijah goes a day's journey, doesn't have any water, doesn't have anything to eat, and he's laying down there waiting to die. And by the way, Brother Rod, he would have died had he not gotten what he needed underneath the juniper tree. Isn't it amazing every time that we're about ready to die spiritually, God will show up with what we need? Hmm? Uh, he knows what we stand in need of. He knew Elijah needed cake and water. Hmm? He knows what you have need of. And when he shakes you, then he supplies what you need. He'll touch you. And then uh, uh, he'll feed you or furnish you with what you need. What a blessing, huh? He's just proven that he's God again. Hmm? He's reminding Elijah, hey, you remember when them ravens brought you some cake? Remember that brook Cherith? He's thinking, you, you remember how I used to take care of you? Well, here I am again. No? When God shakes you, he'll remind you how he took care of you, and then you'll look around and you see he's still taking care of you. Are you listening? Uh so he shook him. He supplied what he had need of. Well, then I want you to see, I'm talking about God's big enough for your it is enough. What did he do next? Well, he shook him again. Look with me again in verse number 7. Look what the Bible says. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Uh, uh, not only did he shake him one time, he shook him another. Aren't you glad we got a God that just keeps coming back, uh, keeps touching us, keeps shaking us, uh, keeps reminding us, uh, keeps supplying for us? Uh, what a blessing. We got that kind of God uh, who's long-suffering, who's loving, uh, who just keeps coming by our way. Uh, yeah, a wave keeps hitting you. But aren't you glad on the other side there's a Lord that keeps coming by uh, and shaking you and reminding you and just touching your life? Uh, Hey, if all he ever did was touch us once, that'd be enough. We're not worthy of that, but aren't you glad he's such a God? He's so big, he just keeps coming by and touching us. Uh, he shook him again. Uh, he said, hey boy, get up. You've got to eat some more because the journey's too great for you. I've got news for you. The reason you're underneath the juniper, juniper tree in the first place is the journey's too great for you. It's too great for me. You realize you can't put one foot in front of the other without His help? But whatever God has in store for you and I to get us to where He wants us, it's too great for us for the energy of the flesh. So we need help from the Lord. That's why it's important to be in the house of God. It might be God's got your cake and your water in the house of God tonight, and He's going to help you because the journey's too great for you. Hmm? 
Well, there's been many times I've crawled into a church service about as low as a snake's belly, and the man of God get up and get to preaching, and boy, God do something, and it gets to bubbling up inside, and all of a sudden I get exactly what I need to keep going on down the road. So we find he shakes him. He supplies what he has need of. Then he shakes him again. Hallelujah. But then notice he sustains him. Look in verse number 8. And he arose and did eat and drink. And when in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. Now the Bible said he ate. Now this time he got some meat. Isn't that what the Bible says? And he rose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat. Didn't say that cake. Listen, there isn't a person on God's green earth that loves sugar more than me. You open one of my veins, it's going to be about 80% sugar coming out of that thing. You don't believe me? Ask Miss Annette about my triglyceride count, huh? Huh? I boast that I could live on sugar, but you can't because you burn that stuff up quick. You've got to have some meat. And notice whatever God fed him. What kind of meat did he give him? I don't know. Could have been Chateaubriand. I have no idea. But whatever it was, it was pretty powerful because it sustained him for 40 days and 40 nights. Can I say this wasn't one of them Gandhi fasts where he, he, he shriveled up and about died for, after 40 days and 40 nights. No, the Bible said he went in the strength of that meat for 40 days and 40 nights into the Mount of God, Mount Horeb. Huh? I don't know about you, but you're going to climb a mountain. You're going to need some strength uh, and whatever Jesus fed him got him to where he needed to be. Are you listening? He'll sustain you. I say it like this on a regular basis. God expects us to do what we can do, then He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. How many times have you thought there is no way, and then all of a sudden you turn around and look and say, I made it. How did you get through? And you'll stand up and say, God helped me. You don't even know how He helped you, but He helped you. Hmm? Why? Because God's big enough. Hmm? He can help you. Uh, you didn't want to stay under that juniper tree anymore, and God wanted you under that juniper tree. Uh, and when you got down to where you needed to be, you look back and you realize it was the hand of God that sustained you uh, and got you to where you are. huh? God sustained him. Hmm. Now, it don't make good sense to believe that God showed up in a wilderness with a cake and some water. Then he shook him and woke him up, told him to eat again, and this time he gave him some meat. And this guy eats that one meal... And he goes 40 days and 40 nights, and he's just as strong on that 40th day as he was the first day. That don't make good sense, but that just shows you how big our God is. Hmm? You see, you can't live you know, by faith trying to make sense out of things. But you sure can't go a long ways down the road by faith when you just trust how big God is. huh? Hmm. Well, let me just explain again. God shook him. He supplied what he had need of. He shook him again, then he sustained him. Now's when it really gets good. You see, some of you, God may have been, been shaking you here lately. He may have been supplying for you. may have had to shake you again. He may have even started sustaining you, and you're doing pretty good. Now's when the sweetness comes. What happens? God spoke to him. Hmm? It's one thing for him to supply what I need and sustain me. It's a whole different thing when he speaks to me. Hmm? There's one thing about his touch, there's another thing about his voice. Mm. I sure do appreciate his touch, but I appreciate his voice so much more. Huh? Matter of fact, when Miss Brittany was singing that song this morning, I'm thinking, oh Lord, I thought we was preaching that tonight. I was wrestling over there, and God wanted that message this morning for this morning, but this one for tonight. Look how God spoke to him. Look with me down there about verse number 9. <laughs> The Bible says, And he came thither into the cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. He said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? How many times has God said, What are you doing? Why are you here? You shouldn't be here. Why are you here? Boy, you ever had God speak to you and you feel so foolish? Only me. Okay. Thank you. Me and Tommy, that's it. Tommy only felt foolish when he started smoking them Twinkies on the plane last time. 
Uh, he, no, it wasn't God speaking. He's speaking to God. God, what am I doing here? Huh? Verse number 10, Elijah responds. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain the, uh, thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Here he's having a pity party. He had the pooch mouth under a juniper tree. Now he's having a pity party. I'm jealous for you, God. I'm looking around, seeing what people have done. They've kicked prayer out of schools, God. They, they no longer preach. They're doing away with the hymn books. Uh, 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 boy, folks just don't seek revival, don't seek worship. I'm jealous for your name, God. I'm the only one still doing something for you, God. That's where he's at. Pity party time. Mm -hmm. Let's read on. Look in verse number uh, uh, 11. And he said, Go forth. This is God speaking to Elijah. Go forth and stand on the mount before the Lord, and before the Lord pass by. And behold, the Lord pass by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And here it is. And after a fire, after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out, stood in the entering of the cave. Behold, there came a voice unto him, and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? You know, as God asked him the same question, but something's happened in between the questions. See, God had shaken him before, now God is going to sober him. God lets an earthquake and lets the wind and the fire and all those things that we associate with the powerful and the mightiness of God. He's a rock and he's a, uh, the one that we can trust in and he's the one we depend on. And all those big powerful things that we associate God with. Elijah didn't find God in any of it. But in that still small voice. And now he's not offering excuses. He's not having a pity party. What does he do? He wraps his face up in his mantle. He's humbling himself now. Now he realizes he's in the presence of Almighty God. And big boy that prayed down fire is really nothing anymore. And then God asks him again, What are you doing here? What doest thou here, Elijah? How come you're here? How come you're not out there winning souls? How come you're not out there being a light? How come you're not out there telling others about the greatness of me. What are you doing here? How many times has God spoke to you and I and said, why aren't you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Why are you here? Friend, I've got news for you. There's always going to be waves of opposition. Because the world hates us. The devil hates us. And even your flesh don't like spiritual things. You're always going to face adversity. But why do you and I let adversity knock us out from where we're supposed to be? Why does God have to come and shake us at all? Why does God have to remind us and supply and sustain and God get us alone somewhere to where we can hear that still small voice again? Because we get our eyes off of God. We get our eyes on the waves. God spoke to him. But then notice God showed him something. Boy, it's a great day after God speaks to you that he shows you something. Boy, there been a lot of times he showed me something, the word of God, I think, wow. That's my God right there. God ever showed you something from the scriptures? Or showed you something in your life that just let you go, wow. What a big God. Look at what God shows him. Now remember, in his pity party, he's crying to God, I'm the only one left. And sometimes you feel like you're the only one doing something. Look what God shows him. Look down there in verse 18. This is what God said to him. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal. And every mouth which hath not kissed him. God says, Elijah, you're not the only one. He said, I got 7,000 still serving me in Israel alone. Hmm? And you know what will happen? 
after God speaks to you, after He shook you, after He supplied what you need, after He sustained you, after He spoke to you and got you to realize you're not the big boy or big girl you thought you was, God will show you there's quite a few still serving God. You're not alone. There are others facing things, and some of them facing more than what you're facing. Hmm? If you're not careful, you get to beat in your chest because all the preachers come through here thinking, boy, we got the best church. We're the only church doing something. Oh, hop in my truck with me. I'll take you all around the country and show you there's a whole lot of churches still doing something for God. Hmm? There's churches out there doing more for God than what we're doing. You need to be real careful beating your chest. God's liable to put you under a juniper tree. Hmm? God showed him. No, I got 7,000. Hmm? Elijah, you're just one little cog in the whole machine that's going on. Hmm? And then God strengthened him. Look at verse 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. You say, what happened? Elijah's under the juniper tree and he's saying, it's enough. And then God shows he's big enough for Elijah's, it's enough. God shakes him. God supplies what he needs. God shakes him again. God sustains him. God speaks to him. God reveals to him some things through the speaking to him. Then it humbles him. He wraps his face. And then God showed him something. No, I got 7,000. But just like God, that should have been enough. That should have been it right there. Got 7,000. Go back and do your job. God said, but because you think you're all alone, you might need a little help. So God strengthens him. And he gives him Elisha. Elisha to go with him. Elisha to pray when he prays. Elisha to learn from the feet of the master, Elijah. And he strengthens him. There's nothing that will strengthen you like God giving you somebody to be a blessing to who turns out to be a blessing to you. Elijah can no longer claim he's alone. He's now got somebody who if you study the next few chapters, Elisha goes all the way to the chariot of fire with him. God strengthens him. And God will put somebody or something in your life to strengthen you so you never end up underneath that juniper tree again. What a God that is big enough for our it is enoughs. Because if you hang around long enough, you're going to have one of them it is enough moments. But I'm glad as soon as it comes out of our lips, God shows up and he's big enough. Now tonight, maybe God's been shaking you. He's just wanting to speak to you. He's just wanting to show you. He's just wanting to sustain you and supply you. He's just trying to get you out from underneath that juniper tree and strengthen you because Elijah goes on to do a lot of great things for God. God's got greater things for you, friend. But he can't see that come to fruition in your life while you're underneath that juniper tree. So he's just been shaking you. Just been working on you a little bit. Just wanting to show you some things. Why don't you let God just put his hand on you? Let God speak to you. Let God show you something. Then God's going to come along and strengthen your friend, and you'll never look back to that juniper tree again. He's that big a God. If he did it for Elijah, he'll do it for you because he's no respecter of persons. He didn't love Elijah anymore, and he loves you. Hmm? And can I say, God wants to help you. So if you're underneath the juniper tree tonight, maybe you need to come and ask God to shake you. Maybe God's been shaking you and you didn't realize what God was doing. Maybe you need to get in this hall tonight and say, God, thank you for touching me. Thank you for shaking me. Thank you for disturbing things in my life so I could see what you're up to. God, I want to hear that whisper that Miss Brittany sang about this morning. I want to hear that still, small voice. God, help the earthquake to go past. Help the wind to go past. Help the fire to go past. 
God, I want to get to where you are. Uh, and God, show me something that I need for my soul. Uh, and then let him strengthen you. Maybe tonight you need to thank him. You realize what God's doing. Maybe God's been showing you. You didn't realize God, what God was doing. Maybe you need to get in the altar and thank him tonight. Maybe tonight you've just ended up underneath the juniper tree. Maybe you need to get in this altar and say, God, I'm sorry. Just show me how big a God you are. You're bigger than my juniper tree. Let's all stand tonight. Brother Clint, come get your guitar. Why don't you play something? Oh, Miss Tina's here. Miss Tina, come and play something. Brother Clint, pick out a song of invitation. Maybe you just need to get in this altar. God spoke to you about something. I don't know. I just know he's big enough. He's proven it time and time and time again. You can read the scriptures and see where he's proven it. But you can look back in your own life and see how big God's been in your life. Say, preacher, uh, I've hit a, a, a stumbling block. Maybe God's just trying to show you or stir you. I don't know. But I know one thing, he's big enough. He's big enough. Folks are coming, they're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We sure do thank you for the story of that juniper tree. I don't know how many messages I've heard you preach through men out of that juniper tree. God, I'm glad to realize in my own heart you're big enough. So God, help folks. There are some that are so anemic in the faith because they just don't realize how big a God you are. God, maybe tonight you've got to shake somebody. Maybe you've got to speak to somebody. Maybe you've got to show somebody. Maybe you need to strengthen somebody. God, whatever you need in this invitation, God, speak to hearts. And certainly, God, for somebody here unsaved, maybe you've been shaking them with conviction about their sin. God, I pray they'd come get saved. God, have your way in this invitation. Now, bless as only you can. We'll not fail to thank you and praise you and bless you for what you do. For it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.